Good morning, good morning. I'm trying to get all the things that are fixed. Are we in? I'm waiting. It's so cruel of me to be ready early when I'm usually late. Everybody's going to be a little hostile. It's okay. I see you, Chad. Chad just uh, figured out how to record himself on a YouTube video. We are a high-tech family. I am uh, live broadcasting it with you guys, and he's at the kitchen table. Good morning, Chloe. All right, so um, I hope everybody had a good Easter. I hate to jump in. Oh, okay. Hi, Libby. What? What snakes? Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I forgot. Don't spoil it. Um, I was like, what? Who did it to you, Libby? Oh, I did. My apologies. Um, so, I hate to, to jump right in and talk about business that you guys are going to be asking me questions about later, but um, this chapter 16 um, <laughs> is... Uh, it was a booger to write. I hope that it is well worth our time. I hope I'm right. Um, after this, we're going to go to chapter 7. And we're going to pick up climate, weather, weather uh, specific, <laughs> specific um, biomes. So you'll be able to talk. Like we're going to break it down into how many forests we have. All that stuff, um, I feel like that is kind of like the last unturned stone that we have. Um, I'm looking at chapter 11 after that. Good morning, guys. <laughs> Sander, I am not in a row. This is a monogrammed sweatshirt. Although I could, couldn't I? Like, just, uh, you know, Hugh Hefner it up up in here. Um, things have taken a turn for the worse. I went from dressing up to, like, not dressing. That could be bad. Hi, Carly. Aw. I love watching you on Strava. Hi, Juju. And Rosie's here in my lap. Oh. Okay. <laughs> oh, there's a delay, so I'm just show, seeing me show you guys my uh, rope. So, let's talk about the test. I don't know what happened with the unanswered questions because I went back and checked my test and they all had answers. So um, imagine this, computer things go wrong sometimes. Um, you guys had an eight or a nine question curve. Can't remember which, it was big. Um, so we had two people that got, good morning Caleb, we had two people that got 42s and we had like 17 people that got 41s so I feel like that takes care of whatever happened to you guys um there were two questions that were actually incorrect um and I, I don't know I don't know whether that's me clicking the wrong button or the answer key being wrong or what that is but I did go back and fix the two questions that were wrong. I do want to say, although it's probably no one that's listening live right now, if you are not taking your test on time, on, on the day that they are released, this is just like class, you're not eligible for the curve. So after the, um, after the test timed out, I went in and fixed those two questions. So the two um, incorrect that were that would have scored you incorrectly have been fixed so that doesn't count against you but if you don't take your test within that 24 hour period and this one I opened early and maybe that's where I went wrong is that um it was open too early I don't know but uh you're not gonna get the curve and if you don't take your vocab quiz when I assign them you're gonna be Doctor point at least depending on your tardiness so I'm trying to record in the book just like I did when we were in school when you actually took the test um, and please remember if you're having internet problems like I talked to a couple of you guys 
And um, as long as I know ahead of time that there is a problem, I'm willing to work with you. But it's when, you know, I, I can see who's viewed the videos and who has not. Um, so when I see you guys not viewing the videos and not getting on and not taking your quizzes on time, that's when you do not get the love. Um, the heart is big and it is full of love for you, but you may not um, take advantage, right? She's also mean and scary. So, oh, and here I go. I gotta take that, take that out. Um, so, just so we're all on the same page, that's how the scoring's gonna go. I want you to always turn stuff in, but if you don't turn it in on time, you're not getting the curve, you're not getting full credit. Um, I'm not gonna take points away from the quizzes that are the unit test, because that's, that's, I feel like that's a little big, but you're not gonna get the curve. So, as you can see, I mean, like an 8-9 question curve, out of 50 points, that's huge, right? Like, you just missed that because you weren't paying attention. So, if you have somebody that you love that's not on here, uh, second block, you fell a little short this time. I want to say, say, let's see, first block. Of course, perfect in every way. Let's get to first block, classwork. Um, everybody's turned in their test and their quiz. Let's go to second block. I will not say who. Um, Four in second block have not turned in your 15.3 to 15.6 quiz, and four have not turned in your test. I'm going to let you guess if you think those four people are the same people. And then we will look at fourth block. Seven have not turned in their quiz, and six have not turned in their test. So, that's, that's pretty big, right? So, um, <laughs> so if you are, uh, if you know somebody that you love that is in, you think, in trouble with focusing on to, uh, focusing on to what we've got going on, it wouldn't hurt to reach out and send them a text message and be like, hey, yo, what's up? Like, be sure everybody's taking their test today. Hey, yo, what's up? Be sure everybody's taking their quiz today. Uh, because it, we entered this dark period uh, with, without a good plan. And I feel like we've got a good plan where you guys can all, like, increase your grades and make things so much better for yourselves. And I hate... That you're not taking advantage of that so talk to me if you know if you're not listening but there's a buddy on here who is listening please tell them to talk to me email me text me and tell me what's going on and let's get him fixed okay so without further ado let's start energy efficiency and renewable energy this is like this first push is big but i put a ton of pictures in there I want to say for architecture reasons. Um, so we just have to look at in the beginning, like what is energy efficiency? And it is a measure of how much useful work we can get from each unit of energy we use. So let me pause right there and say, um, so if you don't move anything, no work is done. So if distance is zero, W equals F times D, right? Work equals force times distance. So if you don't move an object, you've done no work. Uh, mother used to always say, Stephanie, work smarter, not harder. And I was like, girl, I am trying up in here. Like, does it not look like I would rather do that? But clearly all I can do is stomp in place. 
Um, and it's very frustrating sometimes, right? So understand that um, if you if if nothing has moved, we've done no work. So I I thought about including all that in the lecture because that's my physics coming out in me. But we don't really talk about that in this unit at all. So I'm gonna say just keep that card in your back pocket that if nothing is moved, no work can be done. All the force you can put a gazillion um, whatever tons of force of, of million pounds of force, a million, I'm just giving you masses for force, which is not, newtons, thank you, His brain finally kicked in, a thousand newtons worth of force, and if the object doesn't move, you've done no work. So, we want to improve energy efficiency, which means that we want to use less energy to get the same amount of job done. So, if you go to Big Lots, King's, Walmart, um, Home Depot, you're going to see these big stickers on all of the appliances and they're all talking about energy efficiency. Um, if you go by light bulbs, it'll tell you about how many hours that it's supposed to burn before it burns out. Now, some light bulbs have days, but that's based on, I think, only four hours of wattage a day. So, I don't know if I've told you guys about the chandelier in my foyer, but we have this huge uh, ceiling in our foyer and so we put those 30-year light bulbs in there because I did not ever want to have to like uh, l like have a 30-foot ladder up in there trying to change my light bulbs out again and wouldn't you know within the first like month or two a light bulb burned out so sometimes bad things happen anyway uh, typically when you buy things that more are more energy efficient you're gonna pay more and um, they sell that by saying you're going to recoup your money in the long long run. But, you know, um, there are a lot of people that don't have extra money just hanging around. I, I know that you guys aren't homeowners yet, so this concept is kind of lost on you. But I think the recommendation is that you're supposed to have over $500 in your bank account or in a separate account at all times for emergencies. And that's not going to cover, um, $500 isn't going to replace your air conditioner. $500, I don't know if it's going to replace a water heater or not. Um, uh, washing machine, ooh, maybe? I don't know, I'm really bad at this, y'all. I didn't think this through, did I? Um, but you're supposed to have $500 in case things go wrong. And a lot of people don't have that. So when you're considering, you didn't know your hot water heater was going to go out, or you didn't know your washing machine was going to go out, or you didn't know that your dishwasher was going to go out, or your lawnmower was going to go out, and then you have a choice to buy the super expensive one up front that's going to save you in the long run, or to buy the cheaper one that you can afford more quickly right now that's less energy efficient, you're going to buy the cheaper one probably. So um, that's kind of the fight that we're going to investigate in this unit. You may be surprised at learn the, that, to learn that roughly 84% of all commercial energy, and I underline commercial because your book sometimes throws things in there like that, and they expect you to pick up on it, and I don't, I don't always pick up on it, so I don't know that you're always picking up on it. So what I'm reading this as is this isn't necessarily in your home, but this is in industry in large. So about 41% of this energy unavoidably ends up as low quality waste heat in the environment because of the degradation of energy quality imposed by the second law of thermodynamics. Second law of thermodynamics is here over and over and over and over. So for us, remember, it is that idea that high quality energy is always going to devolve into low quality energy and the bulk of it's going to be lost as heat, yes. So the other 43% is wasted unnecessarily, mostly due to the inefficiency of light bulbs, industrial motors, motor vehicles, and power plants. Let me just tell y'all, I'm about to talk to you about uh, motor vehicles, and uh, Xander, please don't tell your dad or anybody else that's in the automotive industry. Chad says that he's willing to come here and talk to us a little bit when the time comes because pff, it's bad, y'all. <laughs> we'll see when it gets here. Another reason for our inefficient and thus wasteful use of energy is that many people live and work in poorly insulated, badly designed buildings that require excessive heating during cold weather and excessive cooling during hot weather. Um, 
I don't know if y'all know anybody that keeps a space heater under their desk because they work in like a old, probably should be condemned building, but um, those space heaters are not energy efficient. Um, and then when we do things like we put in blowers in places where they blow the people who sit underneath them's hair so much that they need to wear a hat, <laughs> oh, but it's not allowed. Um, those are uh, some great examples, I think, of what you've experienced there. This is really not going to apply to us at all. Commuting to work is another example. Well, I mean, I guess it is. I at we don't have a greatly used mass transit system here in Davis County. If you were in Owensboro Public School Systems, then maybe you would have a different opinion of this. But I don't think that any of our buses travel out to, you know, Knottsville. So you don't have a choice but to commute most of the time. Um, so three out of four commute to work in their energy inefficient vehicles, while only 5% rely on mass transit. And that mass transit means city buses, um, tram systems, subway systems, those kinds of things. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't know what this is, but it made me laugh. People also waste energy by leaving lights, computers, and other electrical devices on for long periods of time when they are not using these devices. Um, so in my head, this is what you all see behind you is you've been asked to go to the basement and turn off the lights. Uh, this would make me laugh when you turn off the lights in your room and you run to your bed so the monsters don't get you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Emily, I'm sorry. Um, so, hey, mate, could you turn on the light? Uh, could you turn the light off while I look for the problem? Uh, right? Like, wouldn't you just die? And then there's this one. You wake up at 4 a.m. to go to the bathroom. You turn on the light and you see this. And what do you do next? I, you know, I'm thinking I'm, I'm moving. Um, I don't know if any of you find the humor in this because... You know, I feel like this could have been a glamour shot from my childhood, but <laughs> I don't know. This could also be Trevor Church trying to go to bed. So, I don't know. Oh, gosh. Or maybe Jonathan. Jonathan. Oh, hey. Right? I feel you. <laughs> ah, energy efficiency costs the U.S. an average of about $570,000 per minute, according to the analyst Amory Lovins. I don't know. That seems like a lot of money, guys. And But, of course, that's over the entire um, United States. So, much of this cost is due to heavily reliance on four energy inefficient devices. So, our first data drainer is these huge data systems, which is called the cloud, right? Um, so the best that I can get from this is that we use a ton, a ton, a ton of energy for about 10% of, of what we need from it. But the, but the whole rest of it is spent in ensuring that data, ensuring that lifeline. So they could be a lot more friendly to the environment, but then they could not say, you can back up to the cloud and never lose the picture of your baby chicken, right, that you desperately want to keep for forever. So these huge data systems are one. Here we go. <laughs> the internal combustion engine, which I, I did not, I, when I saw that picture at first, I'll be honest with you, I thought it was a plane. So if there is that thing in front of an engine, surprise to me, I have never seen it. Um, these, motor, uh, these motors waste about 80% of their high quality energy in their fuel. In, or, in other words, about 20% of the money that people spend on gas actually gets used to propel you, which makes me super sad. Um, my ignorance of cars, motor vehicles, and those kinds of things... I'm not saying that it is excusable. I'm just saying that it is what it is. I just don't know a whole lot. 
when Chad and I first got married, I, um, I was so proud of my, you know, my little blue Impala, and I took it to this, I was going to go get the oil changed, and see, there's this thing about Chad, if he, if he wants to do it, if he thinks it's a good idea, then he does it, and if he doesn't want to do it, or if he doesn't think it's a good idea, well, then he just ignores it, like, it's just going to go away or something, so, like, I needed my oil changed, and I may or may not have been a young lady who had never taken care of things like that before, so we were, you know, freshly married, and, and I, you know, Chad was like, you need to get your oil changed, I was like, yeah, I do, you know, and I'm expecting him to be like, well, I'm gonna get right on that, and then he'd just walk away, and I'd be like, oh, gosh, and so then we talked some more, and he was like, you know, you can just pull into one of those, you know, 1999 change your oil here stations off of Frederica, and I was like, I can do that, yeah, I can do that, so I pull into one off of Frederica, I can't even figure out how to pull in the right way, look, I'm for real trying to, like, drive up on top of people, <laughs> and so they all come and run out, and they scream at me, and they tell me, evidently, you have to go around to the back, and then you have to wait your turn to pull up on that grid, <laughs> Oh, anyway, so I may have been marked from the second that I pulled in. I maybe should have just driven away, but I didn't. And so I waited, and they put, they he, I pulled in underneath the thing that said 1999 oil change. And he was like, may I help you? And I was like, yes. And he was like, okay, what do you need? And I was like, my oil changed. And he was like, well, I mean, what kind of oil do you want? And I was like, <laughs> what the, like, I want oil, the oil that you put in your car. And then all of a sudden, he looks over the roof of my car. And he's like, are you tired of paying too much at the pumps for your gasoline well, then, try our new synthetic oil today. It will have you on your way in no time. Is that what you want? I was like, yeah, sounds great. Like, let's, yeah, let's do that. Whatever. So, they're doing my oil. I'm feeling awesome. I'm like, this is, this is it. I'm doing it. I'm bad A. Ha ha. I don't need you, Chad. Give me horn. Like, he's dumb because he's just cutting himself out of my life. Da, da, da. I'm a woman. I don't need no man. And then I go to pay. And the guy's like, that'll be $84. I almost shat myself. Like, it was so bad. I was like, what? It's $20. He's like, uh, that's for the regular oil. You wanted the synthetic oil. I'm like, what the so then I was embarrassed by my ignorance, so I paid him, and then I went home, and I was so mad, and I was like, no, I don't want to pay for it, it was $84, and then all of a sudden, Chad's like, what, and I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing, and I get so mad, because I'm so ignorant, right, like I'm embarrassed, I wanted him to do it to start with, and he wouldn't do it, so I'm embarrassed, I'm, I'm in a place of ignorance, which is, I don't feel like anybody feels comfortable there, right? And, um, and now, and now he's going to scream at me too, like after I've already been through all of this stuff. And so that's when I throw a grade A Stephanie fit and I was like, you listen to me, Chad's going to horn. My daggone car will blow up before I get my oil changed again. You will change my oil or I swear to God, it will never be changed again. And, you know, sometimes I still have to get my oil changed, but, you know, it's better. He took care of it for a very long time, and, and now we have this little fellow named Cody, and he changes my oil for me, and Toyota takes care of it, and it's much, much better, see. All right, nuclear power plant. Y'all feel like we've talked about nuclear a little bit? So remember, your book's opinion on nuclear is hates, hates, hates it. So, um, they're saying that it weighs 75% of the high quality energy in its nuclear fuel and probably closer to 82% when we include the traditional energy used in nuclear fuel cycles. 
coal fired power plants, you know, there is no dirtier fossil fuel than coal. So it wastes about 65% of the energy that is released by burning coal to produce electricity. And it wastes about 75 to 80% if we include the whole cycle, what it costs to, take, to dig it up, to transport it, to uh, take care of the ash, to put it through the scrubbers, all of those things. So by improving its energy efficiency, we can gain, gain numerous um, economic and environmental benefits. And, and we've talked about the pros and cons of that. Or let your book's just throwing out that you're going to gain all these economic benefits. But remember, it's cash up front, which is a lot of the times a problem for our um, lower income humanoids. Most energy analysts feel it is the quickest, cleanest, and usually the cheapest way to provide more energy, reduce pollution and environmental degradation, and slow the projected climate change. So again, you should be pausing here and being like, if it were really that simple, we really would have done it. Like, I just don't believe that anybody's like, yeah, screw you, world. You know, like, it's more complicated than that. So this is a picture from your textbook, and I do think it is on page 399. Um, so they, if you look here on the left, like this is the inputs, the systems and the outputs. And we've talked about this a lot and then it showed up and I was like, oh my gosh, we got to put that in there. So the energy input, notice 85% of that is non-renewable fossil fuels. 8% is non-renewable nuclear. And they put nuclear in a special place because a lot of people feel like nuclear is renewable. Um, hydro, geo, wind, solar, 4%, biomass, 3%. So all of that goes into our economy. And then our outputs are still uh, useful energy is only 9%. Petrochemicals, which makes ice cream. Remember, that's my favorite. Um, unavoidable energy waste is at 41% and unnecessary energy waste is at 43%. So that's how we came up. Remember in the beginning of the lecture, we talked about like 83% of this, this is actually saying 84, but sure, 83, 84% of this is just wasted. And we only use, we only have efficiency of um, much less at that point. Okay, so I'm a little scared. I'm not going to show you guys this video because evidently um, somebody reached out to me and said that YouTube did like ban my, one of my episodes because I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a pirate now. Arr, I don't know. Um, so I'm not going to watch it. But I would encourage you to watch this because I don't, I did not know anything about cogeneration involving the combined uh, heat and power systems. This is one of your vocab words. Um, CHP is on your vocab quiz to help you know when we're talking about uh, cogeneration, what we're talking about. And um, they're basic, it, it, what they're basically doing is this machine, the CHP, generates the initial energy and then they're catching the heat that's coming off of that engine and routing it into our homes and, and those kinds of things, which sounds very good, but that would, in my head, which they didn't talk about, but this is just in my head, so you're going to have to live very close to the CHPs or you're going to lose that heat, right? Heat's going to dissipate as it travels under the ground. Come on now. Um, so this is Denmark. Denmark leads the world by getting 52% of its electricity from CHP systems compared to just 8% in the United States. So I think as best as I can tell, this big white, it looks like a Lego. Like, don't those look like Lego pieces? Um, <laughs> oh, is that a turbine engine? Oh, I didn't know, Caleb. Um, so Denmark is special in a lot of ways. And some of you guys that are hugely passionate about, uh, I think, socialized medicine and those kinds of things, um, turn to Denmark, I think, as one of your, um, beacons. And, you know, there's a lot of cool things about Denmark and the fact that they can do this is one of them. And, um, their community, uh, my understanding is the community is very, um, th everybody is very much on the same plane. So they all have, <laughs> I'm sorry, 
Caleb. Um, so they have, um, they all have pretty much the same religion. They all make about the same amount of money. So they're all, at the, all of their needs are about the same, which is the, the dichotomy of Denmark, I think is very different than the dichotomy of a, um, of America in both size and the people that make it up. So, industries could also use more energy-efficient electric motors. So, I don't know if these are energy-efficient electric motors or not. And again, if I have not thoroughly embarrassed myself by showing you all of my ignorance, let me take it a step further and say, I don't, I don't even know that those are engines. I think they are. Um, and I don't, I don't know how much they cost, but I'm going to say a bunch. And I, I just have a thought, like if, so if you walk into my plant and I've got these beautiful blue raging engines right there called engines, and you look at me and you say, eh, rip all those out and trash them and let's put some new engines in. I feel like I'd be like, eh, right? So I don't know. I don't know if that's energy efficient or not, but those are conversations that you're going to have to have. Um, recycling materials such as steel and other metals is a third way for industry to save energy and money. Producing steel from recycled scrap iron uses 75% less high quality energy than it does from producing it from ore. And I think about um, them stealing the copper out of people's houses and, and those kinds of things. Um, energy efficient lighting, I feel like we have already talked about, so I'm just going to move on from that. This is another one of these, throw your high hat up to the big dog. Um, I don't know if you know Dow Company, but it's they're, they're kind of a big company. Um, I did not put in, but you're free to read in your book. It says something like they're found in 137 countries or something. Uh, memory serves right. And, um, <laughs> and they were able to dump out $1.1 billion into their plants under the premise to become more energy efficient. And then they say that they it resulted in a $9.4 billion improvement. So I think all of that sounds great. Um, if you've got $1.1 billion to dump, you can get $9.4 billion back. I don't I don't I'm and I'm I'm glad Dow did it. That is great. We need these big companies to lead the way. We can improve energy efficiency and save money in transportation. Um, it is 28% of our energy consumption and two-thirds of the world's uh, oil consumption. And we have already talked about bunker fuels. <laughs> um, uh, so we know that bunker fuel is the devil's PP. I I don't know. I, I don't know if trains run on diesel or not. I know 18 wheelers do. Um, so we've got, uh, and I and I don't know what. Oh God, you scared me, Rosie. I don't know what. Um, hey Chad, do you know what tra trains run on? Diesel. Chad says trains run on diesel. And 18 wheelers run on diesel. So that's bad, right? That's a problem. So in 2011, the government raised our fuel economy standards to uh, have new cars be required to get 29.6 miles to the gallon. Now, this is a lie. I can tell you this is a lie because my uh, forerunner does not get 30 miles to the gallon. So there's got to be something that's either wrong in your book or there's got to be some sort of wording here that I'm missing because my forerunner does not get 30 miles to the gallon. <laughs> I mean, it's not a, ga a gas hog, but it's not, um, it's not light. You know, maybe that's it. Maybe it's not a light truck. Um, so energy experts call for the government to require all new cars and light trucks sold to get more than 43, um, uh, that's kilometers per liter or 100 miles to the gallon by 2040. Now, I don't know that you can do that. I looked it up, and of course, you know, we're we're biased to the Toyotas because, you know, it pays the bills. But um, if you look in this picture that I found, there's an electric cord coming out of that Prius. So I would say it's impossible for it to not be electric. 
So when I looked up gas guzzling vehicles, this, I don't even know what this is, but this is evidently like the most gas guzzling car on the planet. Um, okay, trains often use diesel engines to produce electricity for electric motors. Okay, because they have more torque. Yes. Um, so whatever this is, I did not, I didn't know, um, I knew a little bit, like Chad has a hybrid Prius and when you start it, you can't tell you started it. When you go to a stop light, it's like, like the car dies, I swear it's dead. And then it just brrr, takes off again when you hit the gas. Um, so the hidden cost for a uh, full on gasoline car is, Government subsidies, tax breaks for oil companies, car manufacturers, road builders, cost of pollution control, cleanup, time uh, wasted, idling and traffic jams, higher medical bills and health insurance premium resulting from illnesses caused by air and water pollution. There is nothing that your book did not throw at the vehicle industry on this slide. So what your book is doubting is if you paid full cost pricing um, that we would pay $12 a gallon at the pump. And that would include your medical bills. I don't know. I feel like that's a little high. So I picked this picture because I thought it felt like a little space agey. Um, so another option is to give consumers significant tax breaks or other incentives, incentives to buy more fuel efficient vehicles. When they first came out with the Prius, I think it was, um, you got a huge tax break if you bought it because it was like the first of its kind. What exactly is a tax break? So you can, um, if you get a tax break, you can claim it on your taxes when you, when you pay your taxes. So you may actually get money back. Um, it just depends on whether you're paying in or getting money back on your taxes. Um, hey, weirdo, you want to come and just talk with us? Chad just keeps walking by, like, randomly just walking by. You want to come in? Here, Chad's going to come in. Oh, oh boy. Okay. Be, yeah, be sure to grin a lot so the uh, microphone will pick you up. There we go. It's kind of hard to get in there. Here, put that in your ear. Okay. Now you'll be able to hear yourself. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's why you don't have to lean in to the uh, microphone. You can just talk. Okay. You hear you? Is everybody, we got to see we're waiting. Oh. The uh, earbud got yanked out of my head, but I put it back in there now. Oh, good, good, good. Do you see, see how I'm waiting to see us on the Mac? Yeah. Is that it's good? a little bit of a lag. Yeah, yes. Okay. Hello, kids. Glad to see you guys. Fuel cost pricing, that's good. Oh, look, everybody's saying, hey, Chad. It's a very good wanted to talk to you guys about energy consumption today. I work at Toyota over in uh, Princeton, Indiana, and uh, the average daily electric bill, daily electric bill for Toyota is about $62,000. Oh my gosh. For a day. So I know that because uh, they post on the entrances of the door our uh, daily plan and the actual usage. And the idea is to show people, hey, here's what we're planning on spending on electricity today. So be mindful, turn off lights, turn off computers, try to do things to, uh, to save energy. But uh, just to give you an idea, $62,000 is uh, what a lot of people make in a year Toyota spending that in a day 
for electricity. There you go. Um, look at all that. So Xander's dad um, works at uh, Champion Ford, and so he's my he's my he's also my car guy. And he says that Volkswagen got fined for cheating the 26 miles per gallon. Oh, I remember that's a couple of years back, right? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yep. <laughs> they were advertising falsely. Oh, okay. Um, and then I love Luke says fuel cost pricing. Get it instead of instead of um, full cost pricing. Ah. Yes. Okay. So then. Uh, Chloe wants to know what exactly is a tax break and why do the big money gas people get the tax breaks? Um, or why is the uh, why is the book making it sound bad rather? You want me to take that one? Yeah, so okay. the re it's more political than anything. If you, it, you, you've heard the old saying it takes money to make money. A lot of the, uh, the fuel industry and the oil companies they uh, they have lobbyists in Washington, and they're constantly working for tax breaks and to to do things like that. So when you get when you buy one of these brand new cars, you can get a tax break. See, we're talking about how we can give consumers oh, significant tax breaks. I see. To buy these fuel efficient vehicles. Right, right, right. So that's another government program. So they're encouraging people to. Uh, buy fuel efficient vehicles and they'll give them tax breaks as a result. So if you spend $21,000 on a what the government deems as a fuel efficient vehicle, then you'll get money back on your taxes at the end of the year. So why are they calling it bad? Um, I don't know, Chloe. I'm a little confused by your book on a lot of days, but um, typically it's it's only the wealthiest of people are able to buy a new car. And so only the wealthiest of people get the tax breaks. And people on, on the lower socioeconomic ladder are buying used cars, right, that have lower fuel efficiency and probably haven't been taken care of well. Like our forerunner, you have to, uh, we certify every time we take it to the uh, dealer and get the oil changed and we get serviced and all of that is recorded, so when we turn the truck back in, they'll be able to say to the next consumer, look how well this truck was taken care of, um, but not everybody does that, and I think the odor that the truck gets, the further down that wormhole you go of fuel efficiency. I think um, the harder you are on a car, the less fuel efficient it is. That's true, but most people don't know how you treated the car before they buy it again, but the... Uh... Uh, the newer vehicles have the most up-to-date emissions control system, so um, they're supposed to be producing less emissions while being more fuel efficient. That's why the tax breaks. So, Luke, I don't know what you're talking about with, isn't that a little counterintuitive? Um, <laughs> Kaylee, there, nothing about what he just said is big. Um, so I included this picture. So uh, other ways to save energy and money in transportation includes building or expanding mass transit systems within cities. And I don't know if you guys are aware that California is trying to build a high-speed rail. And um, it is, uh, some people have considered or have termed it the um, bridge to nowhere the rail to nowhere, um, it's going to cost more. So that's that's the thing. There is a train that runs from all around to Washington, or was that Chicago? When we stayed in Washington, it runs from all the suburb areas to the capital or downtown D.C. To help with ma mass transit in and out of the capital. Um productive so okay another approach to encourage bicycle use is by creating bike lanes along the highways and on city streets um i used to cycle and he still does um he's actually had some fun with some of his cycling buddies today uh okay here we go luke 
the tax breaks for the oil companies incentives for consumers buying more energy efficient. So yes, um, it's not counterintuitive. It is. So you want to keep the people that are making the product happy so that they keep making the product because that keeps the economy burning. Right. Um, and then you want to incentivize people buying what you want them to buy. So, um, yeah, so that's what I'd say about that. There, that's two different things. So the oil companies are trying to get a break, right? And there are politicians willing to help them. And then there are green uh, people that want to that want to see a green um, earth and care about the environment. And those are the people's lobbying to the politicians for the tax breaks for hybrid vehicles and electric vehicles. I'm so glad we have a car expert right here. Well, there are two sides to that coin. You're you're right. They there are two entities working against each other. Okay, so Chad, do you want to tell us a story about you getting hit by a car? Uh, so I was riding on a uh, a highway or a, a street, Miller's Mill Road. Some of you may be familiar. There is no bike lane there. And um, sorry, I was looking at the microphone <laughs> instead of the camera. There was no bike lane there, uh, but I was riding on that street just the same, and uh, I needed to make a right-hand turn. So I signaled with my my arm like you're supposed to, and this uh, lady drives up ahead of me and makes a right turn as well, and. Instead of hitting her, uh, I didn't actually get hit by her. I, I rolled over in the ditch and fell off my bicycle. That's the end of that story. <laughs> it wasn't as funny as Miss Skimmy. <laughs> well, I, I'm telling you, if you could have heard him screaming and using all of his weekend words when that old lady ran him off the road, and, you know, he's in full spandex, and he's got his little clippity-cloppity shoes on. It was funny. It was funny. The chain came off my bicycle. She didn't stop. She kept going. Oh, look, Chloe loves the bike lanes. Yes. Um, so I'm really surprised that we don't have... Did you have clips on, Chad? I did. I had uh, clip-in... Shoes. Do you do you ride? Clearly. So she says that there were some threats during uh, the Green River try about a year ago. People were saying that they were going to start hitting us on purpose because we were taking up their road. Um, there are cars when I'm road biking that purposely swerve. So I I can tell you um, that I funny. I think the uh, big gas that gasoline diesels that smoke you um, when they drive by are probably the worst. And uh, we definitely need to have a better understanding, especially since our um, Nikki Hayden died from getting hit by a car. Uh, I just really am surprised that Orangeboro isn't better about taking care of cyclists and understanding that the cyclists are supposed to be on the road. If a cyclist were to hit a pedestrian going, you know, 20, 30 miles an hour, it would kill the pedestrian and could kill the cyclist too. So that's why they're supposed to be on the road. It's a big deal. So if we could get more people cycling by not feeling like they were going to fear for their life, it would be a good thing, I think. Yeah, that's true. The University of uh, New, uh, New England, I didn't know um, I tried to look this up. I don't know if this is still a thing, but they offered high quality bikes to new students who were who agreed to leave their cars at home. So when you when you guys go to college, it, cool. it's amazing how used to no freshmen were allowed to drive on campus. And now all of that has changed. And so um, you definitely need a bike. And I think that that's a lovely incentive. Um, internet conferencing, which we clearly all know a lot about now, is being used as an alternative to flying employees to meeting. My sister is a um, nurse that does this kind of stuff. Uh, 
Xander says he rides and he clips in. There you go. Uh, let's see. People do do that when you <laughs> when you're running. And Max wants to know what swerve. Um, they actually swerve at you, Max, and try to hit you. But I don't think they actually try to hit you. I think they just try to scare you. Uh, the worst that I get most of the time is somebody, well, that I notice is that they will rev their engine and it will scare me and I will scream. And hopefully I don't pee when I scream. Um, Kaylee says, since I run out in the country, people are pretty nice. But some of them uh, make me think that they're going to hit me. Yes. <laughs> And Chloe says that her bike is her literal child. It really is. It's so expensive. So expensive. Okay, so here is the hybrid. And again, I don't understand a lot about hybrids. Um, but they emit about 65% carbon dioxide. They get about 50 miles to the gallon. And um, Chad, you drive 100, Chad drives 140 miles a day. So, 70 miles one way, how often do you fuel up? Uh, two to three times a week. That's not very impressive. That's very impressive if you drive 140 miles a day and you only have like a 15 gallon tank. I'm not very impressed. I get about between 40 and 46 miles to the gallon. Um, and that's driving 75 miles per hour uh, on the parkways and, you know, 60-ish on the county roads. <laughs> okay. Luke says, I don't agree with the threats or the swerving, but I think that there are some roads that cyclists shouldn't be allowed on, especially <laughs> as you get further from the city. Uh, tight country roads with many turns. It's dangerous for both parties. Um, and Caleb says, they actually almost killed me because they turned and weren't looking. And then Kaylee says, Luke, hush. Um so Chad doesn't understand the love relationship that goes on. I'm just saying, Luke, I can file for hate crimes and racism. Listen here, Bryson, you let me know. If they get after my little brown buttercup, I will. Mm. Um, we go on the country roads because it's too dangerous for the busy roads for us kids. Typically, yes. Yeah, I, that's where we take ace riding as well. Um... What if you live far from the city? Do you just not ride and then the country roads are longer and easier for training? What about that, Luke? <laughs> Leave Luke alone. <laughs> Sorry, Luke. Uh, oh, Carly's in. That's why bikers always have to be alert because drivers don't see bikers. That is right. And why we wear flashers. And those are lights, not naked people. And... Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and a lot of times you can see the drivers, you, literally, they're looking at their phones yes. instead of you. Yes, and, and it's uh, scary. And that's kind of scary. Yes. Um. So, this is, and I got, did you see Xander? I got a Ford. Um, according to a DOE study, replacing most of the current U.S. vehicle fleet with plug-in hybrid vehicles over the next two decades, uh, <laughs> would cut U.S. oil consumption by 70 to 90 percent, eliminate the need for costly oil imports, save consumers money, reduce CO2 emissions by 27 percent. And I bet if people could afford these cars, they'd be willing to um, <laughs> be willing to cash in. Are you seeing what's happening yes, on the stream? So, okay, so Luke says, I'm not trying to hate, but some people could use the green belt. And Luke, you are right. Some people could, but remember, these road bikes that we're talking about, like, I've had mine up to 40 miles an hour. Yeah, when you can ride, like, bread there, and you do triathlons <laughs> and things like that, then the green belts. Not your friend. Yeah, and it makes it a little unsafe for people walking. Yeah. Now, the best story is I had, um, we were, I think it was us, we were riding, and um, there was a mom and she had a baby and a dog. And so when, so 
courtesy is to, to scream on your left as you're approaching someone from behind because clearly they can't see behind you. So I screamed on your left, you know, and you give them plenty of time because, you know, you're moving pretty fast. And so she didn't do anything. And so I screamed on your left. And I may have been under the impression that she may not have spoken English at this time. And so um, then I got a little hateful about screaming on your left. And so she grabs her dog instead of her, what, 18-month-old, 24-month-old baby? Yes. And I lost my business. Like, I was screaming, swerving. Um, I probably wasn't speaking English at that point either. So, you know, it just depends on what you got going on. Um, so, I'm Xander on the same page. <laughs> uh, let's see. Luke and I don't live in town, Kaylee. Don't make assumptions, Kaylee. Why waste gas to drive in town to go on a bike ride when I can go and bike around my house? Hi, Chloe. Um, it's just a little difficult where I live to drive around, cyclist, where it's tight, hilly, and many turns. Bryson, I never said you did, Xander. It's extremely hard to ride on the green belt, and it does kill your time. Yes. Um, so, oh, Gabe's in. Oh, and Gabe is also on Strava. Uh, I'm, I'm following Gabe on Strava. Uh, when I biked the Blueberry Trail, which is where I showed you there he was, mm -hmm. um, alone, this one guy got so close to me, I swear to God, I almost fell off. <laughs> and when you're clipped in, you can't put your feet down. You just got to go. Uh, Caleb says there's a lot of people on the green belt, so you have to worry about that. And animals. I'm probably going to ride today. There won't be a lot of people on the green. <laughs> so, uh, one of the problems about these cars is the battery. What do we do with the batteries when they're when they're done? And I don't think anybody has an answer for that yet, right? There's not a good answer for what to do with the batteries. So, the the book is absolutely right on the CO two emissions. Yeah, the emissions of an electric motor are zero. Basically, there's there's nothing, no byproducts, but the thing is, what do we do with the batteries when, we, when we're done with that hybrid vehicle? Uh, I'm sure it costs, I don't know the cost of recycling uh, those batteries and are disposing, but it's very high. Well, because I don't think there is a disposing of the batteries. I think that they're just holding them at this point, waiting for the technology to increase. I, she was laying on the thing and pulling on my ear. Uh, Rosie is also with us. She's in our lab. So, um, so the book is certainly up, all up in the using the batteries and they definitely want to, for you to power or repower your batteries by using renewable wind, renewable water, um, biomass. If you could get, if you could recharge that battery any other way than by burning fossil fuels, then it would be awesome. But that is not realistic. Um, and I don't know, I feel like this could be a Toyota plant, but I feel like this could be any plant, really. So all of this hype is a bit misleading. The process of manufacturing <laughs> the vehicle doesn't add CO2 to the atmosphere. It takes about twice as much energy as it should take to build a similar size gasoline powered car. So, you know, notice that your book is doting all of this, all this, all this awesomeness, and they're wanting you to know all this badness about nuclear power, and they're wanting you to know all of this badness about it, these other things, but they fail to mention, they, want, they don't want to go into depth about how it costs twice as much to create these cars and takes twice as much energy to build these cars, and then what do we do with the battery fuels when we're done with them? Because I really don't think we have an answer. I think there's just holding tanks at this point, which sounds a whole lot like nuclear uh, waste, right? Um, this is a battery pack. So when their batteries are recharged with electricity produced by coal burning, natural gas burning, or nuclear power plants, more CO2 is going to be emit emitted. And I, I'm, I'm going to say if you get rear-ended with one of these, it's not going to blow up. Um, it should not blow up. Okay. I know the vehicles that I build, the batteries, the hybrid batteries are actually under the uh, second row of seats. Oh, does that make your butt hot? You know, they've got some vents in the uh, 
seat trims and things like that, I don't think they get hot enough to feel them. That was or a joke. at least burn your butt. I don't think it burned your butt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, my spirit animal yes. right there. The key to greatly increasing the use of hybrid, plug-in hybrid, and all electric motor vehicles is to ramp up research and development of improved, more affordable batteries. And so, I mean, that is basically where we're at, is we're waiting once again on technology to catch up with, or innovation to catch up with technology. Yeah. Um, so, a uh, future stage in the development of a super efficient car may be the electric vehicle that uses a fuel cell, which is a device that uses hydrogen gas as a fuel cell to produce electricity. Now, okay, this is not, not, not my cup of tea, and I'm going to run the risk. No, I'm not. Okay, you just watch it on your own because I don't want YouTube to ban me for life for showing y'all YouTube videos on a YouTube channel. I don't understand. Um, but these two people are basically having a pissing contest to see, like, who has the, <laughs> like, most fuel-efficient lifestyle ever. Oh, that's funny. And it's, it's pretty funny. But then it goes into depth because when, when I started this chapter, Chad was asking me all these questions about where does the fuel come from, you know, all about the hydrogen fuel cell. And the interesting thing is Toyota is the only country, not country, the only company that's making the fuel cell. So I feel like everybody else is going electric. Yes. And Toyota's doing this. Yes. And I don't think he knows why Toyota's putting all their money on this horse. But, but it's called the... Mariah. Mariah. And it's that's, that's their thing. And they're, they're banking on fuel cells so the hydrogen fuel I, I assumed that it was abundant and easy to acquire but after studying a little bit with uh, Miss Skimmy you know she showed me it's not really easy to extract hydrogen from earth atmosphere water uh it's a really awesome, clean-burning fuel, and uh, I guess that's why Toyota's hanging their hat on it, but until you find a good way to harness uh, hydrogen cheaply, it's not going to be... They're splitting water, That's and that's really what they're trying to do here, and um, part of it is going through cathodes and anodes. So remember, cat, positive, anodes, negative, um, so it's just, it's a ton of energy to make the reaction happen. So that's kind of where it's... I've seen it happen. Chad's seen it happen. You... Okay. So I have seen a water molecule split. So the hydrogen and oxygen split. I worked at a place called Alcan. It was an aluminum smelter. And they have these big pots where they are using uh, carbon... Um, anodes to superheat the ore and make aluminum so sometimes those pots get old and they fail and they're designed on a slope so when they fail the molten aluminum runs out of the pot it goes out into a courtyard and then cools hardens and you can dispose of it or do whatever you do with it so one time i saw one of these pots fail it was raining outside and the molten aluminum was covering the water um, faster than the water could dissipate or, or uh, turn evaporate. into steam, evaporate. So it would cover up the water. The water would get so superheated, it's about 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit when it comes out of these pots. So it would cover up the water. The water atom would, or molecule would split, and it would it look like an explosion. It was an explosion. And uh, that's the like, energy you're harvesting, like lava, right? So hydrogen is very volatile, very, you know. But we're wanting H two, not just free hydrogen, which is probably what was happening. Is that those hydrogens just got loose? Uh, these fuel cells are using bonded H two. Um, so, 
So it wasn't just splitting the oxygen atom. No, no. It, was... it splits the oxygen atom, and then the two, yeah, keeps it from blowing up. All right, and just when you thought your car torture was over, or just when I thought my car torture was over, we must consider reducing weight. So that's what Chad um, was talking about the other day, was that they have started replacing the metal parts of the car with... Yeah, instead of steel, we're using a lot more aluminum parts uh, to save weight, and then uh, also some plastic uh, resin parts on the vehicle, like the, the back door, the hatch on the Highlanders is now plastic and uh, the hoods are aluminum to save weight. And so those of you who want to be an engineer, that's your bread and butter is figuring out how to move fast with less weight, which uses less fuel, right? Kaylee's hung up on the Lambo. Oh, Kaylee is hung up on Oh, is that what that is? I think so. Okay, there you go. And lastly, aww. How did you find that? So, Chad used to build these. So, we actually had, in our very first house, Chad and his granddaddy built a building out of this paint booth material. Um, our doors looked just like that. Like, you see those white doors? That's exactly what the door to our building looked it like. Is. Oh, my gosh. So, I have a story to tell y'all. So, um, it was Christmas time. And I had bought Chad a riding lawnmower. And I was so excited. And, you know, because we had this, like, expansive yard. It was, what, like an eighth of an acre? Yeah. And Huge. the funniest part was, like, so before I decided to buy him the riding lawnmower, he slipped and fell in the ditch on the push mower, and I was shot his leg off. <laughs> do you remember that? I do. And, uh, I don't remember it being that funny. <laughs> and so, um, so we've got the, um, so I called Right Implement and I bought this riding lawnmower and I'm like, it's going to be a surprise. And so I have to get Chad out of the house and have to get this riding lawnmower in the building that looks like that paint booth, like a small paint booth. And I put this big red bow on it. And so it was Christmas Eve. I think so. And we were on our way to my grandmother's house. And this guy is so positive about all things in life. But he's especially positive when it's like time to spend extra quality time with family. So yeah. he may have been a little less than jolly little less than old St. Nick would have appreciated. And so um, I had, in my head, I had decided that I, uh, oh, I left the door open. So, like, I'd cracked the door to the building. And he was, you know, so proud of his building and all of his <laughs> little treasures in there. And so on our way out to, the, to get in the car, I was like, oh, no, Chad, the building's been left open. And he's so grumpy and so angry that he doesn't follow the script. Instead of being like, I'll go out there and close the door, he's like, screw the door. I was going on that way before. And I was like, oh. and my brain started going a thousand miles per hour because I was like, not, not, not on the script, not on the script, not on the script, not on the script. So all of a sudden, I just panic and I just walk up and I was like, I'm not going. I'm not going. And Chad's like, what? Of course you're going. And I'm like, I'm not going. I'm not going. This is a trick. You're tricking me. You're trying to get me to go to my grandmother's. So then when I get there, you can be like, oh, we got to go because the building's been left open. And then you're going to be all ugly and nasty all afternoon. You're going to blame it on the open building. Now, I'm not putting up with that from you, Chad Skimmy Horn. I am not. And Chad is just like, <sighs> and I'm like, mm -mm, no, you're going to go. And you're going to close that daggone door. Well, I'm just not going to have it. I'm not going to have it. And I had hidden a camera in like a pile of blankets in the garage. And so then he's so mad at me. And he's walking out in front of me. Do you want to tell him all the names you're calling me? Yeah, well, I didn't call her any names. But I wasn't happy about having to go out there and shut the building door. But then when I got there... Uh-uh, uh-uh. So... 
he's walking out there and he's fussing and I am literally walking like this behind him with the camera right and he doesn't know that I'm behind him and I can hear all these terrible things that he's saying about me mm -hmm. and so then he gets to the door and he puts his door on the handle and I jump out from behind him and I start taking all these pictures and I'm like I'm like oh who's a terrible person now Chad so I have all these pictures of this horrible face yes. <laughs> I did feel a little bad when you know there was a brand new lawnmower sitting there and <laughs> all that. So, to answer a couple of questions, oh, the uh, my story did not hold your attention. No. <laughs> oh, when it's story. in your life, you you don't have to listen. It was so bad. He's already lived through it. He doesn't have to listen to it. That was excellent. So, creating plastic is it bad for the environment? Yes, it's bad for the environment. I think they're. Uh, but so is creating steel and creating aluminum and all that. It produces a lot of uh, um, aluminum, like hydrogen sulfide gas, which is bad for the environment, bad for you if you breathe it. Um, taking aluminum from Ford, yes, Ford did it first. They're still doing it on a larger scale than uh, most places, like the aluminum beds on uh, Ford trucks and that kind of thing. Recycled plastic. So, no. Um, actually, the material is coming in to us in uh, pellets. Um, it may be recycled from somewhere, but I don't think it is. I know when we make a mistake on one of the plastic parts or we uh, drop it, break it, anything like that, we will send it back through a grinder, turn it into a pellet, and use it again. Uh, but as far as using recycled materials from the get-go, I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, Ender, yep, yep, that'd be cool. Recycling takes about as much energy emissions as making new plastic. Now, I'm not sure, James. You may be right. That's Caleb. Caleb James. <laughs> James Caleb. <laughs> so, um, oh, should we, do y'all want another story? Um, I, just a quick one. So, yeah, let's, let's check our time. Uh, oh, gosh. I feel uh, like this is going to be another bad Chad story. No, it's not. Oh. So, Chad used to work in the paint shop oh. at uh, Toyota, and there was this lady that may not have been of the Caucasian persuasion. And she had just had her hair done. And fun fact, I did not know, you are not allowed to have any perfumes, any oils, any, any, uh, I mean, he couldn't even have certain deodorants around the paint. So she had to wash her hair out there at the plant because she, because uh, it will mess up the paint. Like evidently painting is, is not messing around. Yeah, there's a, when you start working the paint shop at Toyota, they give you a list of chemicals that you cannot bring into the paint shop. And um, a lot of those chemicals are found in shampoos and oils and hair oil and all those things. So, yeah, when you do bring a, like a silicone-based uh, material into the paint shop, it will make the paint crater or uh, fish eye, if you've ever heard of that, but like little tiny divots. It's basically the paint not sticking to what it's supposed to stick to, and uh, it's a really big deal. It's hard to get it. Once it starts happening, it's hard to stop it. So they are not messing around. So the cool thing, these composite materials that we're talking about, that we were talking about here, about the... Um, Ultra light, ultra strong composite material, fiberglass, carbon fiber, hemp fiber, which I know nothing about. And what's that word? Graphene. I've I'm never heard of that. I'm assuming it's some kind of graphite composite. I don't know. I've never heard of it. You don't have to paint it. So that would completely remove that whole painting process. Yeah. Now. You're adding uh, color to the resin, right? Yeah. I don't know. That's exactly what my father-in-law, his dad said. He goes, well, I mean, what color is it going to be? It'll be like the, what's the first car ever made? Ford. 
the Model whole, T. Model T. He said you could have four Model T in any color you wanted as long as you wanted black. It's true. <laughs> Mr. Brubaker, take that back. There you go. So um, we can easily design buildings to save energy and money. Buildings are built to last 50 to 100 years. So I just went, we're going to just quickly go on a tour around the world. This is the Taj Mahal. The Pyramids of Giza, which are much older than 50 to 100. This is Acropolis in Athens. Older than 50 to 100. Gateway Arch in St. Louis. It's older. Westminster, I think is older. It's older. Yep. The Colosseum. Much mm -hmm. older. Oh, sadness. So the, the building on the left, the buildings on the left are the World Trade Centers. Um, I believe it's the North Tower and the South Tower is how they were identified. And then this on the right is the One World Trade Center, which is built in its place. Um, so they they knocked the two down. Well, I mean, they, didn't, they, they knocked the two down, but the two were taken the rest of the way down. And then the One World Trade Center was built in its place. I just thought this was cool. I'd never seen it anywhere. I'm going to say this is younger than 50 years. The Lotus Temple in New Delhi, India. Mm -hmm. Ah, been there. So this is the backside of the White House. And this is the Rose Garden. I think they're on your left, don't you? Like, don't you think the president's office is here on the left? I think so. That's yeah. the back? That's the back. Okay. It's older than 50, but... Um... Some of it caught on fire. Yes. I'd never seen this, but I thought it was beautiful. Lamont St. Michael in Normandy, France. Um, what's this one called? Pantheon. The Pantheon. Is that where they had court? Can't remember. And now this, I am, I'm not 100% sure. But I think this is now the tallest building in the world. I know it was. It may like, still be. Right. They kept building. Like there was an argument about the sticks that stick out the top. And that's how they were adding footage. So. And then everybody knows that one. It's older than 50. Yeah. And. Yep. Way older. Way older. Right. So um, you're not supposed to take pictures. In the Sistine Chapel. Yep. And this looks like a, some sort of service. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what's going on there. Um, so we're going to finish up with green architecture. So mm -hmm. I would love this. I would love, love, love a green roof. I would love, love, love. I know that Chloe has talked about growing things up the sides of buildings. And we talked about the degradation of the brick or the mortar. And I feel like that would be a problem, don't you, if it grew up the... like. Oh, for sure. It would, like, I think it is super cool, but it would drive me crazy, right? What is this doing to my brick? Is, are we rotting the structure of my House. building and yeah. all that? I'm sure they design it so it doesn't, but. Or it's, is the building so old that it doesn't matter, right? And it's going to, well, it would matter to Chad, evidently. It but, um, like, ivy and things will kill a tree growing up it right so that would definitely be a problem um so to the points of green ar ar architecture are you definitely want a lot of natural lighting i would love this chad would hate this yes <laughs> um direct solar heating i don't know if either of us would be down for direct solar heating uh maybe uh, insulated windows energy efficient appliance and electric this is what i want a green roof isn't that cool it is cool. So cool. Yep. Um, I think that would be awesome. And here you go, Xander. Just for you. Ford has the largest green roof, and there's a YouTube video for you guys to watch in North America. And I don't know, Xander, you may know more than I do about where it's at. I didn't check the year, but 10.4-acre garden. So they basically took all of the flat roofs, this video that I have for you guys talks about how many, oh, it's something like hundreds to thousands of, of acres of potential green roof space in cities like New York and Chicago 
um, that we could utilize for that. So I think that the that Ford was definitely on the forefront of this. So it says 10 years post installation. This was uh, Ford had the world's largest living roof. It says it's at the Dearborn truck plant. So that's Michigan. And I would think that's very cold up there. So I don't know. I don't know what kind well, of. You know, but the summers are sweet. So, You've been there. Man, yeah. summers are great in Michigan. I had no Summertime idea. Summertime in northern Michigan. Yes. Tell me, Kid Rock. Um, super insulation. I liked this picture because you can see the house in the middle is super insulated. No heat's getting out. So super insulation can come from a, a lot of different places. The one place I didn't know it could come from is straw bales. So super insulation is technically high tech. It's usually a lot of chemical foam and um, it's blown and all of those things. But this is, and I have questions like, does this straw rot? Can you smell it? Um, the biggest, the, the one thing that, that everything that I looked at to research for this that they talked about that I didn't think about is you're losing living space because of the thickness of your walls. Right. So you're losing, I mean, your walls are going to be what, 18 inches thick? 12 inches? Uh, at least 18 a little bit bigger than that, actually, I think. Oh, okay. And, and they talked a lot about castles, that this is how castles were built. Yeah. Um, and they get sprayed with a chemical. I've watched some building, and they they spray the outside and inside, and then you have to sheet that, right, because the, the straw will rot uh, yeah. if you don't. And if moisture got in there, that'd be the end. Yes. Yeah. So... We can save money, we can add insulation, we can seal air links, we can use energy efficient appliances. If you haven't built a new house, you can save money that way. Um, but the one big reason... Let's take, let's take some questions. Okay. So, Brad's asking, why aren't we utilizing it then? I'm assuming they're talking about living roofs uh, at DC. Now, that would be... Uh, I'm sure you have to reinforce your structure create drainage for the soil that you're putting up on top of the roof so there's irrigation. a lot that goes into it irrigation mm -hmm. you, you read it out loud or nobody can read them out oh. you go ahead i'm just okay so why are we still Ender says it looks like minecraft houses Nice. Yeah. There, I did see a lot of stuff on Minecraft houses. Um, Talking about the game. Yes. <laughs> Caleb says it just looks like fire. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, one reason that the U.S. and other country energy resources uh, cost so much is, or while we're not going to these other things, while we're still paying the prices that we're paying, is because the government subsidies and the tax breaks that these big businesses are receiving allows them to keep the, our prices low. So the oil, and you know, big oil, big gas, big coal isn't really a thing anymore, but it used to be, and they would get a lot of kickbacks from the government so that we, the consumers, could pay less and um, not have to pay as much. So, another reason we're still wasting so much energy is there's too few tax breaks, rebates, and low-interest long-term loans, and the other economic incentives for consumers and businesses that invest in improving energy efficiency. So, um, we have a standard washer and dryer. I don't know how energy efficient it is. I feel like it's not very, and Chad does not blink an eye to rewash the same load three, four, seven, twelve times. <laughs> And uh, drives me a little crazy because we don't have an energy efficient uh, washer and dryer. But, you know, is it worth it to us to go pay two, three thousand dollars to trash a perfectly good washer and dryer? And we've decided we've decided so far not yet. But, you know, the third reason is that governments haven't put a high priority on educating the public about environmental economic advantages of cutting energy waste. There is the NEED project that does a lot with energy education. Um, and I will tell you that that's also a very uh, 
debated argument is would it be a one-sided education? You guys did it. You did it. You made it. See, Chad, you almost lost focus, and you only showed up for half of the PowerPoint. We made it, guys. Good job. Y'all did. You did so well. Um, Brad's been to Boston, seeing lots of green roofs there. Nice, Chloe. I wonder why there's so many green roofs up north. I would figure that'd be a southern thing. So they may not have to worry about irrigation uh, in those New England cities because they get rain during the summer and, you know, fairly moderate climate in the summer. Yeah, that's that thing. Now, let me show y'all. This has been in my lap the whole time. We'll see. Mm -hmm. If you guys, I'll hold off um, while we're waiting for questions to end and. Come on. Yeah, go ahead and whisper. Now you know how sensitive that microphone is, you just go ahead and whisper. They'll never hear a thing you say. Oh, I know it. Oh, look, oh, there, there she, she is. There she is. Yeah. Sissy girl. All right, Skimmy, can you open up the stuff on College Board? I did. Okay, that's serious business. I did. I opened up everything. So if it's not open, that's a problem. Because I thought I did. I'll have to look. Have you looked since you asked me to the first time, or are you just asking me again? Kaylee. Have you looked? Okay. So, um, everything up to Let's Unit 7 is open on College Board. And so, um, you guys should have access to everything. Uh, I think... Do you want to go outside? I talked to you guys about... Do, don't do that. Self-pacing... Um, you can either choose to, yes, you looked this morning. That's a problem because it should be open. So I'll take a look again and see if I can get anywhere with that. But, uh, so did Kylie. All right, Luke, you look. <laughs> it just makes me giggle to do that to y'all. Um, because I did open everything as soon as you asked me to. And I posted it on Google Classroom that I'd opened it all. It doesn't say that it's open on mine. It is open. Ah, oh, yes, Ella. So here's my concern. Okay, so let's everybody look on College Board at some point today and see if it's a class because Kylie and Kaylee is in first block and Ella is in second block. It says not open, but when you click to view the assignments, they are in fact open. Yes, awesome. So it looks like you need to click on the assignment and then you'll find that it's open. I just, oh good, it's open for Xander. Kaylee, nobody cares about your screenshot. <laughs> uh, so yes, self-pace yourself. I'm looking um, to start typing your all's test for chapter 16, and then I think I'm going to go to chapter 7 next, climate and biodiversity, to put the, so Maggie, did you click on it? Again, opened, uh, opened, but at first it said it wasn't. So it sounds like it's open, and then you have to redo it, all right? So, um our five-day forecast, I'm looking at, I already have your vocab quizzes ready. So, today was the longest lecture, clearly. Tomorrow, I am going to announce the vocab quiz one and get through lecture 16-2. And then, um, vocab quiz 16-1, 16-2 will be Wednesday. And I will announce vocab quiz number two which will be 16.3 through 16.8. And we'll take that vocab quiz on Thursday, and then we'll take our unit test on Friday if everything moves along. This was the um, definitely the longest of the halls. So everything else should move pretty quickly from here on out. So unless things get crazy, 
and if we may maybe we need to take a day off i don't know maybe a quiz day i won't lecture or something we'll see about all that you guys can um all right so having said all of that um good afternoon family i love y'all uh we're gonna keep on keeping on